let you know who this mysterious voice is. Um, I'm Dennis McManus. I'm the, the head of the philosophy department at the University of Southampton. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the, the first of our of the university's annual philosophy, politics and economics lectures. Uh, obviously, we'd hope to be holding this uh, in person. Um, but for obvious reasons, uh, we can't. But it's it, it, it's 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 very nice that we are able to to welcome people from from so many different locations, as well as a, lo a lot of our own students, which is which is lovely to see. Um, a few practical matters before we begin. Um, first of all, if people can keep their microphones and their cameras off during uh, the the certainly during the the lecture, just to help us with bandwidth and barking dogs and protesting babies and so forth. Um, our speaker uh, this evening has kindly agreed to to take questions after the the lecture. And if you'd like to ask a question, if you could if you could use the raise hand function. Um, I'll generally speaking, try and uh, ask, go to people um, in order in which their their hands come up in as much as I can tell, but I might also jump around just to try and get a few other um, as we're groups represented in the course of that. So don't take it personally if you don't if you, if you think you should be next and and I don't come straight to to you. Um, and obviously when you are asking a, a question, do please um, turn on your camera and your microphone. That would certainly help. Um, and one last thing, uh, last thing to mention is just to thank uh, Tracy Story, who's done a lot of the organizational work behind the scenes with this, uh, this lecture. It certainly wouldn't be possible um, without all her hard work with that. So many thanks to, to Tracy. Um, so this series is uh, designed to explore issues at the intersection of philosophy, politics and economics. And it's a great pleasure to welcome as our first lecturer, Professor Lisa Herzog. She is the uh, she's a professor of political philosophy at the University of Groningen. Groningen sorry. Um, she studied economics at Munich and philosophy and political theory at Oxford. She's published on the philosophical and ethical dimensions of markets, liberalism and social justice, ethics and organizations and the future of work. Uh, books include 2013's Inventing the Market, uh, subtitle Smith, Hegel and Political Theory, and 2018's Reclaiming the System, Moral Responsibility, Divided Labor and the Role of Organizations in Society. They're both published by Oxford University Press. The current focus of her, of her work are the topics of workplace democracy, professional ethics and the role of knowledge in democracies. Um, and I think you'll agree that uh, we couldn't have a, a more fitting first lecturer for the series. Um, this evening or afternoon or morning, depending on wherever you happen to be, uh, Lisa will be speaking to us on what's wrong with the marketplace of ideas. And I'll hand over now to Lisa. Who is currently muted? Let me see. Ah, no, yes, I should be. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for these kind introductory words and for this invitation. I feel very honored. I'll try to share my screen now for my presentation. Um, let's see. Um, do you have it in full screen or almost full screen? Almost full screen, but not completely full screen. Oh, again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess it's best if I just apologize for that minor inconvenience and carry on instead of trying to solve this technical issue here. Um, so this lecture is about a metaphor that has been quite powerful. When one thinks about markets, people have quite different associations. So you hear a couple of markets. Um, nice inviting farmers markets where you can, can buy fruits and vegetables or auctions maybe for antiques or other valuables or financial markets um, with all their high-tech computerized trading systems and the way we think about markets is often used to also describe phenomena in other spheres of life, and that's what this talk is about. 
when one starts thinking about what is this thing, the marketplace of ideas, um, which is still used in, in public discourse, you hear this from politicians and commentators from time to time, and when, when one then starts to look around in the literature, it turns out that there are usually three places that are taken to be the historical sources for that idea. And I'm going to qualify that claim a little bit later on. Um, the first is Milton in the 17th century writing against state censorship. And one of his famous lines in the Areopagitica is, let truth and falsehood crapple whoever knew truth put to the verse in a free and open encounter. So this idea of a free and open encounter, as opposed to some kind of stage regulation of speech, that has often been quoted as one of the origins of this metaphor. The second one um, is John Stuart Mill in On Liberty, 1859, where he says that all opinions, even those that are clearly wrong, should be left uncensored because the, quote, collision with error leads to, quote again, the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth. So again, this idea somehow truth and falsehood or error need to be in this battlefield together. And then the first one where it's actually literally the market was um, a Supreme Court judge in the US, Justice Wendell Holmes Jr. in 1919, where he held in a minority statement that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. Now, when one asks, what could this even be? It's interesting to see that people have used this metaphor at an increasing rate, not already since the 17th century. I mean, this is an Google Books and Chrome Viewer, which is a very rough, I emphasize this very rough indication of very certain terms appear in those books, the text of which Google has already scanned. Um, but it has not been used a lot historically. It came up really since the 1960s. And that's of course in interesting because it might be that, well, you know, since the 1960s, market thinking in general became more popular. So it makes sense that this was also the period when the marketplace of ideas as a metaphor became more widely used. Lisa, but, could I just could I just interrupt for a second? Uh, your your slides aren't aren't progressing. I don't know if you oh, if you dear. meant to. I'll to start be in... sharing once more. I don't know. If yeah, I'm sure. This. Um, yeah. What about now? Yep, that's it. Great. So you saw now see the the historical diagram. That's right. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> so I won't say this again, but you see how it starts really moving up uh, since the 1960s. Um, can you now see the next slide? Yep. Yep. Good. Um, so one more um, clarification in terms of what I'm going to talk about. One could, of course, understand this marketplace of ideas in different ways. And what I'm going to focus on is the idea that there are certain mechanisms here that have to do with how truth and falsehood interact with each other. I'm not going to talk about the place in which ideas get exchanged or something like the media market. So some people have used this metaphor to talk about, for example, concentration in the media market, which of course is also a very important topic, but it's not how the metaphor is usually uh, used. And the claim that comes with the metaphor is, of course, that if you have this free marketplace of ideas, somehow it's going to lead you to truth. So the structure of what I'm going to talk about is, in a way, a number of attacks on this idea, which I hope will reveal some interesting arguments and assumptions and, and ideas about how to think about this alleged marketplace, and also what it means for, for the legitimacy or 
illegitimacy of regulation of that marketplace, because that's how it has often been used. So I'm first going to talk about a few disanalogies between real marketplaces and uh, the marketplace of ideas. Then I'm going to make a more historical, historiographic argument, if you like, that to anticipate a bit, it's actually more battles or sports than markets, what you get in the historical texts. And then I'm going to develop a kind of argument about what we can take from these reflections on a systematic level, about how to think about different spheres or different fields in which ideas are exchanged and what rules should um, hold for each of these. And then I'm going to conclude. So first, some disanalogies. The analogy that is implied here is that there is some kind of automatic mechanism, some invisible hand that it's going to sort true ideas from false ones. Now, one could say a lot about this invisible hand and how it's supposed to work in other markets, and I'm not going to go into this here. But when one starts to think about this in the context of ideas, there are some pretty clear problems that emerge. The first thing is that when you ask what has actually been traded when you exchange an argument or an idea with someone else, what is this item that is being traded here? And in markets, usually we assume that it's certain limited amounts of clearly defined goods and services that are exchanged usually um, for money. But when it comes to ideas, there are a number of problems here. One is that ideas are not the kinds of creatures that exist just isolated on their own without any connection to other ideas. And that's an argument that Sparrow and Goodin have made in a paper about this metaphor. They argue ideas come in networks. So you have network effects because, for example, if you want to understand something about, let's say, COVID vaccinations, usually you also need to un understand certain things about public health, about how vaccinations work. And all these ideas are connected to yet other ideas. And it might not seem to be possible to accept one single item here. You have to accept a whole network of assumptions and premises and definitions and methodologies in order to accept a certain claim. Also, and that's something that economists might be particularly interested in, ideas have a certain public good characteristic in the sense that they do not necessarily become less when you share them. You keep the idea and you share it with someone else and then you both have the idea. Um, and it doesn't mean that you've given it up somehow. And usually in economics, um, when there is this public good feature of a certain item, the assumption is that markets will not sufficiently supply it and we need complicated mechanisms for turning public goods into the kinds of items that are suitable for market exchanges. And then yet another issue and here COVID vaccination is again an interesting example. There is a pretty fundamental question about what it actually means that you acquire an idea. Can you actually do so? when this idea might be connected to pretty complicated expert knowledge and it might take you actually years and years of study and maybe you know getting practical experience to actually truly understand some of these ideas and so you need to trust certain people you cannot acquire all these ideas on your own because whenever you become an expert in one thing you really have to specialize and you cannot cover everything and so um, experts also depend on each other and need to rely on each other. Acquiring ideas is not as simple as just buying apples and oranges in a market. But that's not the end of the disanalogies. Another set of questions turns around what the trading activity actually is. Um, because when you have this idea that these exchanges would lead to truth, the question is, is that what people are actually pursuing? Are they pursuing truth here or are they pursuing maybe something else? So, for example, um, if people in this marketplace of ideas seek partly truth and partly entertainment, then if you have a normal market mechanism, what you would expect is that this market delivers in part truth and in part entertainment. And it may not be so obvious um, how you can distinguish them from each other. Um, and also, 
if we think about this trading, it presupposes that individuals would actually also be willing to let go of certain ideas, namely the false ones that lose out against the right ones. And here um, we've seen quite a bit of challenges in recent years in the sense that there seem to be ideas that people are not simply willing to give up um, when someone tells them a better argument or says that a certain theory has been proven wrong. And that's something where psychologists have done some quite interesting experiments about um, what they call deep convictions or one could also talk about identity constitutive ideas. So ideas that really matter to you as who you are, how you think about yourself, your place in society, your family history, whatever. And um, so these psychologists in these studies have put people in brain scanners and they asked them about deep convictions beforehand and then um, confronted them with countervailing evidence. And it turned out that the part of the brain that was activated was the pain center. Um, I, I'm not a psychologist, I'm, I'm just reporting here. But apparently there's something really deep, much deeper than just on the cognitive level that is going on when someone is confronted with arguments or evidence that contradict their deeply held convictions. And that means, I mean, this is also something that we, we know maybe from our own experiences or the experiences of others, changing some of these basic views that people hold is a long and often painful process. It just doesn't happen overnight the way you, you buy or sell some, some items um, and then you might want to buy them back if you realize they were actually quite good or whatever. It's not this kind of fungibility, as economists would call this, of goods that are traded in markets. And then finally, when one thinks about what is actually good about trading in markets, the idea that economists would give you is that you want to give people the opportunity to allocate different products to different consumers. So you like oranges, I like apples, we can swap them and then everyone gets what the, the kind of mixture that they are happiest with. Or um, different individuals appreciate different kinds of uh, entertainment and so in a free market there's a lot of choice and then everyone can pick what they like best. But that in a way is the very opposite of what it means to arrive at common ground when you discuss an idea or some when you find try to find some um, compromise solution for some problems um, and you want to find a solution that is the same for everyone. And in a way, sometimes when you watch what's going on on the internet, it seems that what we actually get is really everyone gets their own favorite ideas. But that's a problem because at least when it comes to certain basic facts, what we want is that everyone accepts the same ideas, the same truths. So this whole idea that trading of ideas, whatever it would mean, would lead to truth is really a pretty weird metaphor once you start thinking about it. Now, what's also interesting is that on one key question, the metaphor actually doesn't even give us a clear direction in which to go. Um, and that is the question of what it would mean for regulation that we should think about ideas as being in some kind of market. Because Different people looking at different markets, you know, arrive at different conclusions about the need for regulation. So some commentators have tried to make arguments in analogy to the need for regulation in markets, for example, arguing that there are market failures or externalities and said that this is also how we should think about the marketplace of ideas. So while the majority of people have used this metaphor, at least in, in the legal literature, have used it to argue for free markets without regulation, some have tried to turn this metaphor around and to say, well, no, 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 other markets also need regulation. So the marketplace of ideas probably also needs regulation. For example, um, if you have hate speech that has been compared to a kind of pollution, the way in which um, uh, a company might pollute a, a river, which also needs regulation through the state. And, and one other example here is that 
when you talk about markets, there is often an implicit assumption that there is some kind of level playing field. But in the marketplace for ideas, that's clearly not the place because people are in such different position when it comes to how they can speak, what kinds of audiences they can reach and so on. So again, some people would say, well, we need regulation in order to approximate a level playing field here, whereas others would say, no, 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 it needs to be an unregulated market. So on these substantive questions, the metaphor doesn't really give us um, support in, in providing an answer. Now, you might think, can it really be the case that Milton and Mill and all these writers had such a bad metaphor in mind? And here, my second argument comes in the more historical perspective. And it is actually really interesting when you start to go back to the original texts, because what Milton and Mill suggest in the language they use is actually not marketplaces, it's battlefields. And that also makes sense if you think about their historical background um, and the not always so peaceful political life uh, in, in, in different places they, and, and the reports they would have received. Um, it's about a completely different set of metaphors, battlefields and not marketplaces. And interestingly, in Milton, there is even a place where he explicitly says that we shouldn't think about truth or ideas or whatever as something to be traded. So I'm going to read this quote for you. Truth and understanding are not such various as to be monopolized and traded in by tickets and statutes and standards. We must not think to make a staple commodity of all the knowledge in the land to mark and license it like our broad cloth or wool and our wool packs. So he's making fun of people who think of ideas as um, broad cloth or wool packs. Um, and yet he's standardly being quoted as being one of the intellectual grandfathers of this idea. So interesting, what we seem to have here seems to be a case where academics have copied from each other without actually going back to the original sources. Um, at least that's the only explanation I could find for these three um, sources always being quoted. Um, and it's actually not about marketplaces at all. So what can we make from that? What, what, what are we supposed to do with this battlefield metaphor then? In fact, um, this idea that argumentation, the exchange of ideas is a kind of war, that is also uh, a kind of metaphor that has been used quite often. And it has often been criticized as being so aggressive and suggesting a kind of win-lose scenario instead of a win-win scenario where everyone can benefit because everyone allegedly arrives at the truth. Um, and it's also not quite compatible with the texts to think about it as a kind of um, completely um, unregulated battlefield or war situation with no mercy for um, the enemy whatsoever, as it were. Mill explicitly says that there should be a chance of fair play to all sides of the truth. And he advises his readers to study the adversary case with great care. That's not the kind of attitude you have towards enemies in a battle. Um, but again, I think they, did, they didn't write about this because they didn't see this problem, but more because for them, the metaphor really applied to the ideas. So the question then becomes, if you have a battle of ideas, what does that mean for the individuals? And I mean, this is another sort of weird metaphor, but I'm going to suggest it nonetheless, because it might be helpful for seeing um, what I'm trying to get at here. You could maybe think about it as um, having horses that you send into a race um, and you're sort of standing there and watching and trying to see uh, which horse is going to win. But if you think about it that way, it implies that all the participants need to have a certain sense of sportman sportsmanship. So you need to obey the rules of the game. You need to accept that, you know, when you lose, you lose. The referee has the last word, all these things. Um, if you're really, you know, a true sports person, you should also accept that certain strategic maneuvers are actually ruled out um, because the spirit of the game is determined by its rules and the goals of, you know, having a good time there and winning, but not at all costs 
violating the rules. Um, so it's not a sense of winning at all costs. It's more a sense of we have a social practice here. It comes with certain rules. It has a certain internal logic. And in order to participate in that practice, I need to be willing to obey the logic of that practice. Otherwise, I'm just not playing that game. I'm doing something else. So what I think that implies is that one thinks about the search for truth along these lines, there are actually pretty clear and pretty strict standards about what it takes for individuals to participate in the kind of social practice that would lead to truth. What that requires is that one knows which discourse or which game, if you want to use the metaphor, one actually is participating in and what the rules are. And it's actually quite interesting that if you look at the negative cases of confusion of public discourse, fake news strategies, social bots, all kinds of evil players trying to confuse the public, a very popular strategy is not to tell outright lies. I mean, that would be too obvious in many cases, but somehow to confuse people about the context that are in that they are in and about the rules that are valid in that context now if you are in a context that is supposed to be oriented towards the truth that presupposes two things the first thing it presupposes is that there can be truth about a certain matter about religion art this is debatable and there are a lot of debates about this but it also presupposes, secondly, that people are actually oriented towards this truth. And one obvious um, example here would be the, the scientific system. Scientists are supposed to be oriented towards the truth um, and not just towards winning at all costs in any sense. But when one then thinks about, OK, what does it take to have such a social practice where truth orientation really you know, has a chance, as it were. I think one has two levels that one can distinguish here. One is the individual attitude. So the individuals need to have the right, what, what philosophers call epistemic virtues, um, virtues towards um, the acquisition of knowledge. But also, I would argue, the social circumstances need to be such that it's possible for individuals to attain these epistemic virtues. Um, for example, if you have a system where individuals are supposed to be truth oriented, but the costs, if their idea loses, are extremely high for them, then we just cannot expect that they will all be epistemically virtuous. Um, we just need to be realistic about human psychology, and it's sort of a very cynical um, attitude to expect individuals to be epistemic heroes, if you like if the costs of your own idea losing out is, for example, that you completely lose your job or lose your career or so. So if you really want a social system to be oriented towards truth, you need to make sure that the social circumstances are right. And I'm not going to go into what this means for academia now. It's something we could discuss later. But I think there are some real questions here. When it comes to this question about regulation, which, as I said earlier, the metaphor of a marketplace leaves completely open. I think what we see is a certain constellation which we have with both markets and this marketplace of ideas in a way. And that is that on the one hand, we want the system as a whole to have a certain quality, for example, truth orientation, or at least avoidance of the worst kinds of fake news, let's say. But on the other hand, we have certain individual rights. And these individual rights also deserve protection. Now here you get an interesting um, conundrum because if the only justification for these individual rights were that they play a role in contributing to this marketplace of ideas and then for all the reasons that I've um, discussed this idea of the marketplace of ideas is wrong anyway then this justification for these individual rights would fall away. But there's a pretty broad consensus in the philosophical literature 
that these individual rights, so in particular the right to free speech, maybe also right to free press and, and all these things, they have a broad justificatory basis. There are many different kinds of justifications for why free speech is really important, which are independent of the idea that free speech contributes to a marketplace of ideas. So it's not a circle here, but rather the question is, okay, how can we ensure that these individual rights are sufficiently secured, while on the other hand, the quality of the overall system is also ensured. And this is actually a pretty sort of typical constellation when you think about market regulation or the regulation of other institutions. There are often different values that need to be weighed against each other. Um, but I would argue that we shouldn't think about this as a matter of one sphere of public discourse or one big marketplace of ideas. Instead, what we have is actually a plurality of different fields, different social contexts in which different rules for speech can hold because these different values can be weighed in different ways. So, for example, in different social contexts, the, the, the balance between the right to free speech and, on the other hand, protection from insults can be drawn differently. And by the way, it's also quite interesting that in different countries, these lines are drawn quite differently. And some free speech um, defenders, especially from the US, who have a pretty absolutist position on free speech, seem to think that as soon as you start regulating free speech, in some small ways, you will automatically enter a kind of slippery slope that will lead to horrible forms of state regulation. In response to that, one can really point to the many countries in which free speech is actually more strongly regulated, and yet there is a lot of room for free expression, and it's not as if, you know, one form of regulation was piled upon the next, and you'd have the slippery slope to, towards uh, a complete loss of free speech. Another distinction here, maybe sort of trivial from a conceptual philosophical perspective, but I think in practice and in political life, it matters hugely. And that is the distinction between speech by human beings and speech by corporations. Um, I'm not saying that all corporations are evil or so, but corporations are institutions that are set up for a certain purpose, which is to maximize shareholder value. At least that's the way they're currently mostly treated in law and also in practice. And those kinds of creatures have a different attitude towards speech because they will usually speech, uh, speak strategically in order to maximize their profits. And it's not at all clear that their speech should deserve the same kind and the same amount of protection as speech by human individuals. I would argue that part of some uh, US jurisprudence, speech by human individuals has a much greater weight than speech by corporations. And you might then say, well, if that's the kind of regulatory framework you want to get, then the corporations will just hire human beings um, to speak on their behalf. But, you know, there can be limits on what kind of speech um, on behalf of corporations can be allowed. And maybe more importantly, I think it can be a requirement to make it public, to be transparent about corporate sponsorship when a human being uh, speaks in public discourse. Um, and that, again, is, is also something which in online public discourse, I think, is, is hugely important because lots of forms of speech there are ultimately by certain interest groups, either corporations or political interest groups. Um, and very often this is not made transparent and it's treated as if it was on a par with speech by human beings. And that can create huge asymmetries and um, undermine certain qualities of public discourse. A third question here is whether this question about a level playing field 
needs to be addressed in certain contexts. Um, because usually there's this assumption that somehow all participants are equal when they enter a certain arena. But of course, that's not true. That's a legal fiction. And that's often the right legal fiction to hold. But when you think about it in practice, there is a follow up question, which is, well, who can actually make use of their rights and who has certain rights as formal rights, but cannot practically use them? Um, so the, there is also, I think, a legitimate question about whose speech gets too little attention and might require certain forms of boosting. And of course, again, there, you need to weigh this against certain other considerations, um, the individual rights of others. But in the societies we live in, it's pretty obvious that we have massive imbalances um, in thinking about who gets hurt, who has what kind of attention, um, and how is this regulated? Which communities have media that speak to their interests? Um, which, which communities can communicate successfully online, not only amongst themselves, but also being heard by a broader public? And if you think about the marketplace of ideas as this realm where this all takes care of itself automatically, then this whole question doesn't, doesn't arise. But if you think about it as different spheres in which different rules hold in order to make them truth conducive or to realize other values or to weigh these values in different ways, then this question actually comes to the fore. And I think it is a really important question. Now here, it might be said, well, this is all pretty, um, this sounds very problematic. It leads to censorship. It might sound like I'm trying to homogenize public discourse or, you know, force everyone, no matter what they actually want to do when they go online to speak truthfully, or maybe that's something I haven't endorsed or anything, but sometimes you hear this in this context, everyone needs to reveal their true identity and there should be no space for anonymity whatsoever in the online world. But I think that is actually too much that that goes too far and I wouldn't want to endorse this because I think we need to distinguish which of these discourses are meant to be truth conducive and which ones have different aims and one challenge again of the internet is that it all gets intermingled and we often don't quite know what kind of discourse or discursive space we are actually participating in but if you had all these kinds of exchanges in a real life setting, it would often be much easier to judge from the social context, from the rule, from, from the settings, from the um, way people behave, the body language and so on, whether or not this is meant to be truth conducive. But what is interesting is that the transitions between these different spheres and these different forms of discourse with different expectations, different standards, can vary quite massively. Um, and one interesting example here is the relation between scientific discourse and public discourse. And here I'm going to um, come back to an example of how this um, marketplace metaphor actually continued to play a role until very recently. It wasn't used literally as a metaphor, but this thinking of, you know, let all the ideas battle amongst each other in this free exchange that was behind. So, so here is um, the scenario I have in mind here. Um, in science, the evidence for man-made climate change has been building up for decades. I mean, there were, you probably all know this, there were four, first indications pretty early on and then since the 70s um, different scientific methods have led to different results and over time they all added to a picture according to which um, there really is this phenomenon of man-made climate change based on co2 emissions and it really creates problems for um, the habitable future on our planet now, for a long time, that kind of scientific discourse remained more or less within the academic sphere with occasional encounters with the broader public. 
And these scientists were more or less following the rules of scientific discourse, which by and large are meant to ensure that discourses are truth conducive. But at a certain point in time, um, it became clear that this was also a matter for politics. And at the same time, it became clear to certain corporate actors that, well, if politicians listen to climate scientists, then this also really becomes an issue about regulating certain industries like coal or um, gas or yeah, fossil fuels in general. Um, and all the industries that depend on the avail availability of fossil fuels. One way in which these corporate actors have reacted was by emphasizing that there was actually no scientific um, consensus on this issue. And that's just in parenthesis, that that's a strategy that had been used in other fields before. It, it goes by the name of tobacco strategy because the tobacco industry was the first. And the general pattern is science is never 100% sure or it takes time and there are controversies and so on. And the fact that science has controversies is then being used by those who have a certain set of interests to suggest that there is no consensus, it's all controversy, and you cannot base regulation on controversies, can you? So it was a matter of delaying regulation. But here's the interesting thing. One of the facts that massively helped um, obscure the scientific insights about um, climate change in public discourse was that in especially the US media, there is this principle of fair balance that you should always present two sides of an issue, always give the other side a chance to reply and so on. And that goes by this, it goes as this fair balance doctrine. And the interesting thing is that when you think about political discourse, the fair balance doctrine makes a lot of sense. But when you apply it to a scientific debate, something like climate change, it's really not the right kind of approach because it's not like for every scientist who says there is this phenomenon of uh, man-made climate change, you should also listen to a climate skeptic who says, no, it's actually, uh, it's not true. And um, yeah, and, and, and just comes up with some alternative theories or so. So this idea that you should have a fair balance confuses political and scientific discourses. And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, the, the decision about what to do about climate change is a purely scientific one, but the discourses that are needed and that are, as a matter of fact, being used for establishing whether or not there is an issue of climate change, those are scientific discourses. And for that kind of discourse, this idea of a fair balance is actually not the right one. But until very recently, this was how this was applied. And I think the deeper reason is that, especially in US discourse, this idea that truth will win out in this open encounter with falsehoods, that has just been extremely pervasive. And still, I think in 2017, the New York Times hired a climate skeptic um, amongst their editorial staff. And the reason given was that you want to hear both sides. So again, let truth and falsehood crapple. So this marketplace of ideas metaphor isn't just some kind of, you know, beautiful uh, rhetorical flourish on some legal text. It's something that has really influenced um, thinking and, and politics and, and, and the way in which um, newspapers are run. And that's one of the reasons why we need to be so careful about it, just because it is so powerful. So I'm coming to a conclusion here. Um, it is really one of these metaphors that we should dismantle, but it doesn't mean that dismantling can answer all questions. And it's quite interesting when one actually returns to the original texts, there are some very clear descriptions of some of the remaining challenges that we are still confronted with today. And I'm here going to draw on two that come from Mill. And he's very clear on two issues that are still uh, a problem for us today, I would say. One is that often 
we have to act before truth has been fully established in a certain area. And I mean, the COVID pandemic is full of examples for how you know politicians had to make decisions even though the evidence was not yet out on certain issues. And Mill is quite clear that this is a challenge and that ha we're not going to get away from this because truth gets discovered over time. And often we cannot just sit there and wait till we have a full picture. Decisions need to be taken. And that is going to be a challenge for politics. And we can also add, it's also one of the places where vested interests will often make an inroad and try to influence policymaking because they can always say, oh, it's not established yet, even though the evidence is building up. And second, uh, Mill also has some very interesting things to say about the challenge of keeping truths that have been clearly discovered alive. He's very much afraid that certain insights might become what he calls dead dogma. So people know certain things, but it just doesn't influence their actions in any way. Um, and here he argues that, especially in sort of pedagogical contexts, grappling with the opposite position can actually be extremely valuable because it, it encourages people to really think about why certain things are true and why they matter for them. And that kind of a psychological effect that can be very important for keeping truths alive and connecting them to action. And again, here I would say this is also something that is still a very important question for politics and society today. There are a lot of truths that have been scientifically sufficiently well established, and yet we treat them more as dead dogmas than as the kinds of living truths that Mill was after. But those are questions that we need to address without being misguided by this metaphor of the marketplace of ideas, which I guess in the final analysis has much more to do with the zeitgeist of the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, when markets were just the paradigm of freedom and this miracle of social coordination, but without allowing us to gain any substantive insights from this metaphor. Thank you very much, and I look very much forward to the discussion. And I'll stop sharing my screen um, so I can actually see people again. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, I, I trust everybody will uh, show their appreciation in the uh, traditional fashion. So I believe we will stop recording at this point. Is that correct?